Is it rolling now? Yes, good morning and welcome to the third week of this course. Uh, it's very good. I have a very good news for you and uh, bad news also. So uh, the uh, good news is on slide number seven. I was very happy yesterday when I saw it, but I'll keep the tension a little bit so you can see it uh, later. The bad news is that uh, Torbjörn is not uh, coming today. Uh, we swapped, so he'll be here on Thursday, on Wednesday instead of me in the morning. And um, but he sent his uh, he is making very very uh, detailed notes for your reports, and um, he is he is sending it to you. You, you may call him if you have some questions or wait till Wednesday when he's here. Um, good, but I will be, um, we will start. This lecture is about uh, international development aid. And uh, it's not about everything about international development aid. That would be a long course. But focused a bit on the water sector, focused a bit on the NIDA, the Danish uh, support to developing countries and focused a bit on the NGO, the development aid that is given through the non-governmental organizations. If we look overall how development aid is, is done internationally, you can see that we have some donors, some people with some money, and we have some people who are poor and need the money. So how, if we look at how do the money come from these donors to these people here? Um, they don't go directly like that. We don't send the money to the people here. Most of the aid goes through uh, a government. The local government in Malawi or Cambodia or whatever it is, that is sent through the government. You cannot work directly with the people from the Danish government. Some of it goes through the United Nations. Uh, yeah. A lot of things are done together by countries, uh, uh, donor countries. Uh, they are pooling a lot of money together in, in, in one uh, bag and then they are, they are making projects together. Also, again, always through the, through the government or in agreement with the government somehow. There's also some commercial banks. Governments uh, out here take loan from the commercial banks and then they're doing projects with some help from the international community. And then there's some of the money that goes through the non-governmental organizations and um, that can go, as you see, outside the government. Of course, you, have, you need permission to work in the country with the people, so to say, but, but it is not the projects that they are doing are not agreed with the government as such. They can, they can do their own uh, projects um, because they are small, I suppose. You need some people to help with managing this, and this is where uh, you come in when you are finished as uh, engineers here. You could be working as a consultant in one of the consultant companies. Uh, then you would probably be involved in managing the, the projects. Uh, so the government is accountable. They have to be accountable to the donor here. And that there's a consultant uh, often from, uh, from uh, the donor country. Um, that is controlling the, that the project is running well, managing the project as such. Or you could be a contractor, you could be the one that is actually building the uh, big uh, water supply schemes, wastewater treatment plants and, and so on. So the contractors would be working in the countries here. Normally both these two nowadays, contractors and consultants, are also working closely together with a company in the country uh, there. Lot, most of the contractor work depends on the situation, but uh, often most of it is done by local contractors actually, but maybe with uh, a contractor from the donor country involved somehow. So this is the, say, general, the big money, uh, different flows of uh, money from the donor countries to, to the recipients here. If we look at particularly the civil society, that is the, the branch that goes outside the government and that we are looking a lot at in, in this course. Uh, you can see it goes from the donor 
through the non-governmental organizations to the people. But actually, the NGO is not just the NGO. There's the NGO. There's an NGO society in, in Denmark, for example, or in the, um, in the Western countries. And then there are NGOs in the local countries. And typically, the NGOs here would not speak the same language as these. We would not have the same culture. And uh, maybe it would also not be sustainable in terms of uh, things being working after we leave if we work directly uh, with them. So, so it's a big advantage that we work together with an organization that is local, that know the culture, and, um, but have some extra skills so they can manage uh, the project. Yeah. So the North, Northern NGOs would be working typically uh, with a local NGO. Some large NGOs and uh, Red Cross is not always called the <coughs> NGO, uh, Save the Children. Um, uh, yeah. So there are some large NGOs which has branches in, in many countries. They could be, uh, they have their own programs. Where, where they're working with, with their own branches or with the South NGOs in, in, in many countries. So we, we separate between large NGOs and small NGOs. And it has to do with the way they're financed in, in Denmark. At least it, it is like the large NGOs has their own money for their own programs that they can plan for many countries for many purposes, while the small NGOs has to apply for every project that they do uh, project-wise. And the small NGOs are applying to something called CISU, uh, Civil Society in, in Development, it's called. And um, this is what you're going to do this week, write an application for CISU. If we look at the, yeah, so, so that was, let's say, the flow of the, the money and, and how it's organized here. If we look at the ways that development aid has been done uh, during the times. I tried to make up some some headings uh, that shows that, that it has developed quite a lot uh, from the years. Development aid started more officially maybe a bit before but around the 60s uh, it was very much like we sent a hand pump down there. We built it in, in uh, I don't know, Germany and we sent it to Tanzania we give it to them, we install it, use it, and uh, then it didn't work. They found out it didn't really work because uh, they were not able to, to run it and so on. So they found <coughs> out in the 70s, let's put it more into a project frame. So they started to send experts there to install the things, to uh, tell people how to do and how to work it and, and all that. So they, that everything was put into to projects. Then they found out those small projects, they're not very uh, sustainable. So, um, and one of the things was that, that people are not really, they don't really understand when they're just told what to do. So they start to talk about participation. So having people more involved in the project, having people involved in the planning and uh, the uh, implementation and the so, so they could also take over the, the maintenance and the management after, after the... And things get, got better and better. We, we did definitely better and better projects. But st uh, still, uh, from the uh, perspective of development as such, we found out that those projects are too small. We cannot get a, a, a big impact on the country. They want to say, Danita, Danita wanted to have an impact on the on the whole country development of that they could start themselves making their water uh, projects and their water uh, supply system. So they started to do in the 90s some sector programs, a sector-wide approach it was called. And that means they worked with, the, say in Tanzania or um, in Ghana or Uganda, they started working with the water sector. The Danita would give money for the water sector. So they would do a few projects in a few places, but then they also work with the government in the central place to build up the capacity all the way up to the top of the water ministry so that all the people at different levels, they were 
given capacity so they could actually run and develop these things. So that was very much talk about sector programs. Then they found out that Norway came with their sector program, then Denmark came with their sector program, Holland came with their sector program, and everyone tried to you know, compete about the good people, the, 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 the bright people in the ministry. And uh, they had a little bit different ways of doing things, not very much maybe, but Denmark would do way, things in one way and, and Norway would do it another way. So they said, let's try to work together. So in the 2000s, they did a lot of donor alignment uh, where they put uh, money, started putting it into the basket. So they, they worked all the countries that, that supported the water sector, they would be working together and combining things. They also started to do budget support. Some of these countries uh, uh, who had received development aid for many years and got gradually better, especially in administrating the funds, they found out it's better we give the money directly to them. Instead of sending all these experts uh, that are very expensive, let's give it directly to the countries who can, who can manage it. And then put some, uh, you know, first they have to make audited accounts and so on. But those who can manage that, they were giving a lot and still is giving a lot uh, in direct budget support. So, I was trying to think recently, what is the new trend? Because it's not so obvious what is happening exactly here. And easier when we look back after some years. I think nowadays what has changed a lot the last few years is the focus on fragile states, place, countries where, where the government is not working, it's not existing, uh, where there are conflicts and so on. In, in before, say, 10 years ago, we tried mostly to avoid these countries. We, we wanted to support with the sector-wide approach, with the budget support and all that. We wanted countries that were actually able to manage their things. But uh, seeing with all the, also I think the terror and everything that's going on, the, the instability, instability in the world, uh, the donor countries have found out that we need actually to focus, even though it's difficult, it's much more difficult to work in a country with, where there's conflict. Uh, we need to work with these on, on, to, to avoid the instability in the world. So that is very much the uh, agenda nowadays to, to work with Somalia, with uh, uh, putting a lot of money into Afghanistan and uh, uh, Syria and, and all that. Also, the inclusion of, um, uh, say, armed, uh, when we send, send armed forces to Afghanistan, for example, that is also becoming part of the development aid, which would not have sounded good in the 80s or the 90s that we were using money that way. But nowadays, it is like that. So this is uh, how it has uh, developed historically. And um, uh, I think, it's a good question, uh, you know, how has also the results developed. If we look at the, how the money is spent from Danita, now we move to <coughs> specifically Danita here. Um, we can see that the, so for the total aid from Danita was 2.9 billion US dollars, or 16 billion Danish kroner. And uh, the biggest sum uh, went to Africa, directly to Africa, smaller to Asia, and also a lot of money to interregional. That that is projects <laughs> that are uh, in, in in different regions or more broad, uh, given to subjects or maybe a bit unspecified here. Um, we have. This is the bilateral aid. This is the aid that is given from the needed without working with other countries. This is about 70%. And 30% is given through some international uh, organizations, United Nations, mostly here. <coughs> These are the countries that the is uh, working with. You can see a lot of the poorest countries uh, in the world. But also even China, I think they work with, for example, water resources management in China.
But they do have some countries that they call the priority countries. These are the yellow ones here. Uh, these are countries that have been followed, followed for many years, like 20, 25 years. Uh, they are working with the governments to, uh, to enhance a lot of uh, different things. This picture is changing over the years. But, uh, and right now, Vietnam and uh, Bhutan is actually uh, being lifted out of poverty. They're too rich now. And so they are, they are being phased out those projects, those uh, programs that they have in those countries. So the, the picture is changing here. But basically, still, it's uh, some of the most uh, poor countries that they're working with. If we look at the sectors, what are they, they giving you money for here? Government, civil society is, uh, they have a lot of programs which is helping to create good governance to make sure that the country is able to manage, to plan and implement their own projects <coughs> in general. And that is the biggest sum here. Humanitarian aid, as I said, for the conflict areas and, uh, and for uh, refugees and, and, and all that. It's also a very big amount of the Danita's uh, development aid nowadays. Some unallocated, unspecified here. Multi-sector cross-cutting. I don't know how they separate with the government, civil society, but, but this is maybe more project-like uh, things. Administration cost is 162, so it's about 6%. It's always been over the years about 6% 6 of the total cost of development aid is administration. Then we have uh, refugees in donor countries. I don't know how to separate from humanitarian aid, but it's also about humanitarian aid. Education. Now we come to the sectors that, that, that is a little bit more uh, measurable for us. Yeah. Education, 100 million, 137 million US dollars. Agriculture, 100 million US dollars. Here, water and sanitation, 80 million uh, US dollars here. Energy, also 80 million. Community aid, so high. So it is sometimes, somehow in the, in the good end, water supply and sanitation. And that was here where I come to the good news of today. That is, when you look more into this, this is taken from a page on the NIDA, and if you click on this water supply and sanitation, and there, this is where the good news comes. If we look at this, then the 80 million given for water supply and sanitation, 35 is given for basic drinking water supply and basic sanitation, whereas less 27 here is given for water, last water supply system, and 11 million is given for water resources, policy, administrative, management, and the five million for education. So that's the good news today, that this course is not a waste of time. You are not uh, wasting your time by being here. Uh, I have been wondering, you know, over the years, this course has existed since about 1980, when we had a water decade. In the 1980s, they decided, beginning in 1980, I think they decided, at 1990, everybody should have access to clean water and sanitation. That was the goal of the 80s, the water decay. But still, we're here. We're still having the same course, and the course was made to address that decay. But still, the need agrees there is a lot to do. And 35 million US dollars, we are 35 here in this course. So it's 1 million US dollars per person per year. So that's not bad. It's not bad. Good news of today. Right, Dania is having water projects in, in these countries. Uh, of course, a limited part where they work. Some places they work with education, some places with water supply. You can see some of the poor uh, countries here. But China, is, I don't think it's a lot of money, but they, they are working with water resources management over there. So maybe cross-country, cross-border things. Even in Serbia, they're working with some urban water supply here. The Danita strategy right now that also changes with the new government or a new two years period, we need to have some new strategy. Now, uh, they're focusing very much on the rights-based approach. They say everybody has, we have to look at the human rights. What We have a right to uh, drinking water. We have a right to, to food, to a house, to a 
and so on. Looking at those drives and trying to help people serve that is important. Flexible partnerships, that is working with countries for a long time and uh, being able to negotiate and change the directions according to the results that we are getting is, is two overall principles here. Other than that, there are some focus areas. Human rights and democracy is one, related to that one, you could say. Green growth, when, uh, when, when we can create something that is uh, ecological, ecologically sustainable things, green growth is, is high on the agenda. Social progress, and the last one is stability and protection. That is the humanitarian side. So these are four principles, and two main ones, fighting poverty and promoting human rights. Again, uh, the rights are, are very high on the agenda. So that is the overall strategy that um, <coughs> is used here. If we look a little bit uh, on some policies, I, I don't think that this is not something that changes a lot over the years, but when the policies on water supply and sanitation is, they have some, some, some principles here about national policy development, establishing national programs based on the uh, government and the UN uh, partnerships, institutional development, performance management, Monitor sustainability, uh, institutional, financial, pro public, pra private uh, actors, decentralization, demand responsive approach. They don't talk about you know specific uh, latrines or specific water supply systems, but there are some overall principles that they are um, focusing on that uh, they should be. Uh, made sure in any project you could say you, you would be looking at these issues when you're working with water supply in a, in a country. Then there's focus on the rural, on the small towns and the peri-urban areas. They don't go into, generally they don't go into to big cities, uh, water supply sanitation. Uh, uh, they want to focus on the rural areas, on the peri-urban areas. Now that some years ago we changed, the more people are living in urban areas, they're putting more emphasis on the on the peri-urban areas, you could say, but still a lot to the rule. And then promotion of affordable, appropriate technical options, and they want to put more emphasis on sanitation. That's because in the first years since the 60s, a lot of focus was on water supply, and they found out that sanitation was lacking a lot behind. That's I also showed in another presentation on the first day here. So, now I told you the history, I told you the strategy, you can ask yourself, does it actually help? Because we're still working with water supply after all these years. Um, I used to, in this course also, to, to work with some projects in different countries. We had Tanzania programs, the Ghana programs, uh, Uganda, programs that has been running since the since the 80s or, or even before. And we looked at the reports and what was the result here. And some of the conclusions are, are these here. Found out that latrine and hygiene education is often very low in the project, in those projects. I mean, that's the conclusions after they did the project when you look at the evaluation reports. In review reports uh, during the projects, they always, they often say, put more emphasis on the sanitation. I mean, the, the planning is there, water supply and sanitation, but the only thing implemented was the water supply, because sanitation is so difficult. So, but, so they were told by reviewers, um, put more emphasis on sanitation. Found out it's difficult to sell the toilets, and they gave um, a lot of subsidy to water supply. They didn't give subsidy to sanitation. Yeah. It could <coughs> There could be some relation with the results also to this fact. So that was some of the conclusions uh, up to 2000 here. Then uh, the latest big review that was made, I mean, these were just some observations that I made, you could say. This was a big review made in 2007 where they looked at programs in Bangladesh, Benin, Burkina Faso, Egypt, Ghana, Uganda, and, and Vietnam. And from 
uh, projects that have been running uh, 1990 to 2005. This is the most recent we have uh, of the Danish uh, projects here. So they looked at all the 268 part goals that were set for these projects here. They found out that out of the 268, uh, most of them were quite satisfactory obtained. So that was quite good. But still about uh, 55, uh, so it's about 20, what is that? 20% uh, was not so satisfactory um, um, done here. So it's some success here. Some of the highlights that they, from the report that they made here is they found out that the Nida is a major player. Um, they, they, uh, they go usually also into countries where they can have a, an, an impact. So they are one of the big players in, in that sector in that country. Yeah. They are quite appreciated by the local government. Uh, they like the reliability, the continuation. And they are quite active internationally in, in UN about water supply and sanitation here. So they found out in that period, 1990 to 2005, 5.8 million people got access to water. 3.8 million got access to sanitation by the Nida here. And only in Uganda they measured whether actually the water supply still worked after five years, I think, as I remember. And they found out that 20 to 25 percent did not work after five years uh, when they came back. Usually they don't do that check uh, coming back after five years. But uh, so it's not reported. But it's a bit worried that so much is not working after a short time. You can also see there's still a difference, even though we know that sanitation, we have known that for a long period, sanitation is lacking behind. Still, they make more water supply than sanitation in the project. Christian? Yeah? So, equals 20% of water for access. Is that the <coughs> worldwide impact that Denmark has? Uh, it is. Uh, it is in, in one country, in Uganda, for example, if we look at all those who got access to water supply in that period, the NIDA were project were responsible for about 20% of it. It's just to show that they are a major player in the, in the, in the area, in those countries where they work. So, so the NIDA, and, and that's an in interesting number here. If you look at the sanitation, also a lot of people got access to sanitation. But the NIDA was only responsible for 10% of that. So it seems like even <coughs> though recommendation has been there for many years, they still put much more emphasis on water supply than sanitation here. Some other comments they saw, it's, these were some of the main things for the NIDA uh, in 2007. Gender equality, they did too little about this in the projects. Um, Improving environment, uh, environmental consideration, they also do too little. Uh, and with about good governance, uh, they do a lot uh, in the Danita project. They're not following all their, their, their priorities, you could say, uh, very well, actually. Yeah. Some numbers, and this is important also for your, for your work here. The NIDA paid for water supply sanitation in the project. They paid about between 25 to 60 US dollars per capita in villages in rural areas. And these are total project costs. This week you're going to make an application and you're making a budget with all the costs that is uh, implied here. So this is for the Danidas projects, and they're not NGO projects really, they are the more expensive ones. 25 to 60 US dollars per capita that got uh, um, water supply and sanitation. In urban areas, it's much more expensive. As you can see, they paid a lot more in the investments uh, in the systems for <coughs> urban areas. Total average, 41 US dollars um, per person who got access. And this is a number that I think you should uh, keep in mind when you make your budgets this week here. Uh, you should not be more expensive than the normal Danita projects. And um, because Danita may say no, if you come with an application that is so expensive that you, 
had to pay $100 per person who gets water, they will get suspicious and say, are you, are you effective enough? Or efficient, I think it's called. Ah, just finishing off with the comments from the reviewers here. The user organization of groups were insufficiently involved in the planning and design of systems here. It's led to reduced open ownership and sustainability. Um, you know, these comments are very, yeah, I get a little angry every time I see it because the, this, this is something that we have worked with. And it has known this from, from back in uh, 1980, 1990, that participation, <coughs> involvement of people, and, and I think we're putting a lot of emphasis on it here. But somehow it happens when we start to do the projects. We start rolling into big machines and building things. It's much easier for a, for a, a project leader maybe to, to manage all this technical <coughs> thing. So he forgets about <coughs> taking time to discuss with the people what is it actually they want, what, how do they actually want it to be done, and so on. We know it's necessary. We know we get better results. We get better projects, more sustainable uh, things if we do it, but it's so difficult, so time consuming and, and so on. So therefore it's not done, and that is even pointed out in 2007, you know, it's now, uh, after we have known this problem for 30 years. Good. This is getting a little bit more uh, detail on, on some principles uh, for you here. The Danita water supply and sanitation policy has not been changed since 2000. There's still a little <coughs> blue book uh, with these principles here that is relevant. They say about uh, rural water supply, uh, there can be some cost sharing uh, about the in initial capital investments if you have to establish a borehole for, uh, for the village. Uh, you can pay some of it. We talk about cost sharing, not, not totally. Uh, the payment. Operation and maintenance uh, should be cost recovery. That should be paid by the people themselves, by the money they pay for the water. They should also cover future investments. So if you install a hand pump and let's say it has a lifetime of 25 years, the payment from people should actually be able to save up to buy a new hand pump in 25 years. This is very seldom done, I would say. I don't think um, it's, it's possible to, to save up all this money. It's difficult to handle all those money you look in a local village, but uh, at least cost recovery of operational maintenance is important here. And they also have a principle, if you say you offer a basic uh, water supply system that is good, uh, delivering the service, the service level, like having only two, uh, only 250 per water point, only 500 meters, and all that. Those principles, if that's okay. If people say, but we need, we want a better one, then they should pay the difference between the basic one and the better one. That is a, that's a principle, say, for the need. When it comes to rural household sanitation, then it's a private property. Therefore, subsidization should be avoided and in no case exceed the level applied by the respective government. For example, in India, the government is actually giving subsidy to, the, to a basic slab. Uh, they are paying uh, about half of the price of the slab. So therefore, it's OK in, in uh, the local uh, government subsidy. Um, you can even pay from the project money, but it's not uh, such a good idea. But you can make use of the local subsidization. But otherwise, uh, no subsidization. People should pay their own sanitation. The last uh, few slides here is about um, particularly the civil society, <coughs> the uh, non-governmental organizations like our little organization, the ULA. Um, there was a strategy about this uh, with some overall uh, definition, uh, overall priorities, and so on. <coughs> it's back from 2008, it's not been uh, updated, although there's a lot of discussion about this all the time. Still the one from 2008 is applying. They want to build uh, societies that are vibrant, have an open debate, 
uh, should be locally based uh, civil society, not dependent on uh, on outside here. Uh, focus on capacity development, advocacy, work. Uh, we'll talk a lot about that tomorrow. What that means, but then it's helping people to to uh, say local people to get access to the government, help to be their advocates when they, they go and demand their rights. And uh, focus on networking opportunity here. Focus on rights. They also want to make a special effort for fragile states, uh, fragile situations uh, when it comes to civil society. So at least in, in those days, I think it's changed a bit. They said that it's mostly NGOs who can work in the fragile states. The government, the Danita, cannot make a big project in Somalia because there's no government to work with. But the civil society, the NGOs, they can go in and work directly with people and local organizations. So that, that is uh, the reason for this. Uh, they also put emphasis on the involvement of the Danish civil society. They are very much encouraging that Danish uh, organization, like DT Ule, for example, could, is also involved in giving their expertise to the local organizations. And they mentioned that, that, that with the NGOs, we can work with other stakeholders than the government, the direct Danita government, because they have some bounds with the working directly with the government here. Yeah. Danita is supporting uh, this way, they implement it through Danish NGOs. They are not taking uh, applications from foreign NGOs generally. They are, they are working through the Danish NGOs. And they find it through different uh, channels. And here's again uh, the, the, the difference between the big NGOs, the large NGOs, and the small NGOs. Large NGOs. They have a frame contract. For example, uh, the Dan Benita, Dan Church Aid, the uh, church organization that is helping, or Mellemfolk uh, one, one of the very big NGOs in Denmark, they receive maybe 100 million Danish kron per year. And they're doing many projects, but they are themselves managing in every year they would send a, a report to Danita saying, this is what we did with the money, Next year we want to focus like this, and then they get all in, in one go. And then we have the, ah, the names have changed here. Uh, I think it's called the Civil Society Fund now, not the Project Fund. Um, and they actually put together. I always saw that change. Yeah. But recently, we have um, there's one fund that smaller organizations they can apply to one fund uh, up to five million kroner. Maybe even that number is higher now. But a small projects of up to 5 million kroners can be applied for by the small NGOs. Yeah. And that, those money for the uh, small funds here is um, administered by the Civil Society for Development, the CISO. CISO is actually, from its beginning, it was an, uh, an umbrella organization for all the small NGOs. Uh, it has more than 200 members. So it's an, uh, it's an association of, of all s small uh, NGOs here. The, its purpose is to build capacity and promote the networking among the organizations. They do some, they help the organizations when we are writing applications, they will help us to formulate it. Uh, so they are working as kind of consultants for all these NGOs. They have, uh, I don't know, they have about 20, or, or, more, or more, 20, 30 people, I think, employed. Some of them are consultants that help all the small organizations writing applications here. Then they also, apart from helping the small, they also administer the so civil society fund. That's what it's called now. That was formerly the project fund. They're administering that, uh, but of course, when we, so we send also applications to them. So at the same time, they're helping us to fill the application and they're also the one deciding, but that's two groups of people. So they, it's more like they're administrating it, uh, and then someone else would be reading our applications when we send it. You can find a lot of the uh, information about what they do on this uh, place here. And I would say what you're going to do this week with your application is, is, is a, an application to CISU. We're using that format. Um, 
and, and the <coughs> principles that they, na they are mentioning, they are all applicable. Uh, they, we, we try, you should try to write an application that follows what CISO would like to see. But, yeah. But I will tell you much more about that tomorrow morning, about the application that you are going to do. Um, today, I have two other lectures. Uh, one about that, uh, one about making a problem tree, and another one about writing a logical framework approach. And that's what you're going to work on today. Tomorrow, you start on the actual application. And I'll give you an introduction to that in the morning. Do you have any questions about, uh, say, development age in general, or things you wonder about? Uh, yes? How big a percent of NGO, small NGO uh, projects are funded by not CISO and not any uh, like private funds? Um, that's a good question. How much, how much is funded by other funds? Yeah. Uh, it depends. The bigger NGOs, some of them have uh, license to collect money every year. Some of the very big NGOs, uh, Red Cross, Dan Church Aid, Mellemfolkets Armvirke, EBS, um, some of these organizations, and eight, eight, ten organizations. So they can uh, organize a collection of money. They also go to the street and collect money, and they, some of them are trying to collect a lot, and they have to. There's some rules. If they should receive the 100 million or 50 million krona from the NIDA, they have to themselves provide at least 10% of that, or 15, 10-15% of that. So, so generally, you could say for the big organizations, I think their, their main contributions from other sources is 15% or something like that. The smaller organizations, like our DCULA, that is mostly on paper, but we have also the UHU that I'm working with in reality. We do not collect money. We get a little income from the members and, and so on. But a lot, but if you, if you look at the time people are using, you know, if you, if you say, <coughs> well, say one hour work is even 50 krona, I think the contribution would be very, very high from the small organizations, which is different from the say the more professional aid given through the companies, through Kobe, Grandmai, Rumble, all those com companies, they don't, they don't put any money into their projects. I mean, they, are pro they, are, they are earning money from this. So they, they you can say the contribution is zero. From the NGOs, it's, it's much higher. There's a lot of voluntary work involved. In, uh, so if you calculate the voluntary work that is done, I, I would say it's very high. What about funds as yeah, hundred funds or Linux or whatever they're called? I mean, the, don't the they also fund <coughs> No. They have yeah, they have a they have a bit of a CSR uh, thing. They have a Kobe fund and uh, Ampel fund that you can apply for making projects, for example. I don't know. Maybe that's if they are very big they, that is one percent of their their network. Okay, so most small NGO projects will be funded by CISO? Yeah, a mm, lot of them, but they can also be from funds, like COVID fund. I mean, yeah. I'm talking about the big money, uh, but there is yeah. possible. You can apply as a small organization, you can apply a COVID fund for, say, 50,000 krona for, for something. But you can apply the need a SISU uh, for 2 million krona. Uh, so th there's a difference in that. There is some smaller money floating around there. From you. <laughs> Maybe when you start working, you start paying tax and so on. Maybe you have that, do have a work, then you pay tax. <coughs> the NIDA spends about 0.8% of the total Danish income on development aid, the 60 million billion krona. That is 0.8% of the gross national product in Denmark. And is it the place where the Money from tax to development goes. Yeah, I mean, to Danida. Then Danida gives out of the 60, what was that? Out of the 12 billion dollars, 
I, I'm having both dollars and crowns in my head. They're spending 160 million on NGO projects. Uh, you can you can see the numbers on the Danita homepage. Uh, so 160 out of I say two billion. About 10 percent is given to to and through NGOs. The rest is given through government programs, through the United Nations programs where you work directly through the through the government in the recipient countries. I know that the bigger organizations can make get these grant breaks, they are mm. mandated, they have to do these uh, internal things in Denmark. I think the school children are to be aware of, of these problems. So the same thing that it's more to know that there is some of the funds that you get that you have to spend it. Uh, it's you. It's appreciated. It's very much appreciated from Danita, from Sisu, that when you do projects, you also try to tell the Danish society that what you're working with. So you're spending some of the money for for giving information in Denmark. When it comes to Sisu, to the smaller NGOs, when you apply, you can apply for up to two percent of the total budget. So it's not very big, but up to two percent of the budget. You can apply for for information work in Denmark. Uh, I I wouldn't say that they are they are doing uh, they are doing actual implement implementation of work in Denmark. Maybe some of the organisations because of their their mandate uh, they are also working in Denmark with with children. For example, save the children. That is a very good example. They're doing a lot of development work, but they're doing a lot even more work in Denmark with children. So, so, but that is because of their special mandate. Uh, if you look at Mellemfolk in Zambia, uh, if you look at Ubu, we are here just for developing countries, so we're not implementing anything in Denmark. Mellemfolk in Zambia is a lot of things in Denmark as well. And I think they have to do it in order to get the big framework. They are doing information work in Denmark, but they're not implementing, I mean, they're not supporting, uh, uh, supporting people as such in Denmark. Uh, from what I mean, just saying the raising awareness. Yeah, raising awareness. That's right. And some of, I think that is connected to to the big framework pro uh, contract. They have to contribute to the creation of awareness. Yes. But that's just not the same decision. You don't have to raise awareness. It's small. It's it's voluntary. They, it's uh, you know one point on the application scheme, and they CISU themselves do a lot of. They do some work. I would say in uh, raise, raising awareness, and they are suggesting to the small organisations that they also include work in Denmark, but it's not a demand. And I, I, I can't say really if it's positive or negative. If you want to, if you do uh, information work, but, uh, you should have a purpose at least. Yeah. Yeah, how much goes to salaries? Um, a lot. Uh, a lot of the. If you look at the the funds for, I, I think you may find some numbers on this uh, Danita's homepage about this. Um, if you look at the big projects administered by Danish uh, uh, companies like Kobe and Carbo. Uh, one mind. Um, it's, I mean, they're they're quite expensive in their in their salaries, um, but they have to limit it. I mean, the most of the money should go for implementation locally. But yeah, how much is it? It's it's. Uh, I I think you will find it, maybe it's ten percent or or what I don't know. I don't think it's 20, but maybe it's 10 percent that is going to salaries. I don't know if that's high. If you look at there's something called administrative costs also. Like I said, Danita has six percent themselves in administration. That is for paying for the people working there. Uh, I mean, I suppose it's mostly salaries, but it could also be house rent and so on. Uh, so that's six percent, and and they are 
I think they're doing a lot to try to keep uh, salaries down. If you look at the payment in the companies and in the big organizations, I think it has to be, it, it's not, Danita will not pay salary for the head of Red Cross. I mean, they, they, they don't do that. that. They have to do that with their own money and how they organize that. That is an internal thing. You cannot put, yeah. But uh, it's, it, 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 it may be an issue in some places, but not, not such a big issue. Right? This one? You skipped the, uh, yeah, that's oh yeah, it says government and civil society. Yeah, I don't know exactly what's behind. I mean, it it is uh, when they in the when they work in the water sector, like these sector-wide uh, programs, they are trying to support in the local in in Dar es Salaam, where they have the water, Ministry of Water. They are supporting the. Uh, how to plan the planning office. So they are maybe paying an extra person or they're paying some s people for doing special work for participating in training and, and so on. Um, there's a lot of money going for that. I mean, they, they, there's a substantial amount of money because they find that it's more effective that you, if you can develop their own ability to, to work and plan and so on then it's more sustainable, it's more pointing to the future than implementing a few water schemes here and there. That will help in the situation, it may be running, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that next time they can build their own system, unless they, they work with this. Um, I mean, you could try to dive in more into what, how much is given to salaries and so on, uh, but, yeah. Corruption is always a very difficult issue to for for the donors to um, to work with, and uh, there is corruption in in a lot of countries. There is absolutely zero acceptance of corruption. I mean, no, Danita is not giving money to corruption. They may be cheated here and there. Somebody may cheat and use the money uh, wrong, uh, but but they would never accept, not officially, not in practice, not in theoretically, they would not accept to pay uh, to pay any bribes or anything. But, but of course some money are, are going that way. Um, it's very high on the agenda. When they, when they give budget support, you could get more afraid that they just pay money to the government and then they have to manage their own project. You, you could get afraid uh, you could fear that there would be a lot of money going to corruption, but they're quite strict on their their control of the of the accounting in the, in these uh, cases. So it's difficult to say, you know, how much is going one way or the other into some corruption. Uh, it's 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 difficult to say, but it's a it's an it's an important issue. But just to make it very clear to everyone. There's zero acceptance of corruption, but we all, all know that sometimes it happens anyway because people are being cheated. And someone asked before how much is private funds and how much is government funds and big uh, NGOs. And my girlfriend, she worked at Care Denmark and mm -hmm. they get 25 from private okay. and 75 from the government, but that's also higher compared to um, most other NGOs. So yeah. Yes. Twenty five is twenty five is probably high, yeah. But there's a demand from the government. If you see a lot of, uh, you meet people in the street who want you to join, uh, 
to join Red Cross, uh, to join uh, Save the Children or join Amnesty or anything. A lot of these people, I was very surprised a couple of years ago, I found out they were paid. I thought it was voluntary people trying to get people into the organization. But nowadays they are paying. They are paying people to stand there and getting other into the organization. Spend a lot of money on that uh, because it pays off in the end. And they have to show at least these 10 to 15 percent of self-payment. Is it only with the um, project uh, CISO uh, application for over two months or so that you have to that you have to uh, get twenty percent or so of the money yourself? Twenty percent of the money yourself, but you support like if you have a budget for two million, and then you. Uh, you yeah, no, when you apply to CISO for the smaller project, there's no demand that you have to pay something yourself. But they, they say it's an advantage. I mean, it will help your application if you can say you, you do have, uh, you do provide some money yourself. Okay. So we put a small one, not a big one, in CISO? Uh, the big ones cannot apply CISO. I think nowadays it is actually CISO somehow administering the cost. I think that's a new change. But uh, Red Cross, uh, Save the Children, those big organizations, they cannot apply for projects <coughs> at CISO. They get their frame contract and that's no, but it. Yeah, but I meant big projects for small NGOs. Big project for small NGOs. Yeah. Again, there's no demand. As, as far as I remember, there's no demand. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a lot of ways you can get income into the project. Even from, even you can tell people are paying themselves for sanitation. If you start counting, you know, if you have a sanitation project and you say people have to pay themselves, that is an extra income to the project that people are paying themselves. You are providing, you know, skilled capacity training and, and, and all that, but then you're getting money into it. If you are sending out students, you could also claim that that is a, a, an input to the project, not in monetary. We, we cannot find all those money to pay from our pockets, but we can put some work. This lecture is about what you're going to do today. You're going to make a problem tree for your village, uh, for your project, and uh, after that you're going to make a logical framework approach uh, matrix. So, what is a problem tree? That is a way to illustrate the different problems that you have in your society and what is the underlying causes for them, like a tree. You can see the stem, you can see the top of it, but there's also some roots down there which are very important. When you make a problem tree, you start to decide what is the central problem here. And th this example I'm showing here, we are trying to solve a problem that too many girls don't go to school. That is a common problem in many developing countries. So. Uh, if we look at what is the reason for too many girls not going to school, there could be some different reasons. It could be that the girls' education is not prioritized in, uh, in society, by government, by the families and the culture. It could be that the school is too far away, so they don't have time. It could be that they're often sick, uh, or someone is sick, so they are staying home to take care. Or well, it could be that they just have no time to go to school because they're doing other things. And if we look one layer under this, let's say these are the four main reasons here. There is some reasons for these things also. Uh, for example, the reason that the school is far away is that the government don't prioritize the school. So they don't build enough schools and uh, that's why you have to walk a long way. What is the reason that they are sick, they don't have the energy, could be the poor sanitation, the poor water supply, just to make it simple, uh, will make them uh, sick. And they have no time to go to school, that's because they spend a lot of time on carrying water, because the water supply is too poor, um, and they're taking care of sick uh, family members at home. So there are some underlying reasons. We, you could even go further down here to, to 
exemplifier to find out what is the root for these things. But you stop at a certain time here. Um, this can also lead the reason the thing that the girls they don't go to school also leads to some other problems. That means that the power distance between men and women is getting bigger because the men are educated and the women are not. And uh, they are lacking knowledge and they have poor opportunities for earning money. So that is some things that follows with this, uh, that too many girls don't go to school. That follow leads to other problems. But the reason, the thing is, I said from the beginning, we're trying to focus on a, a central problem and then try to solve this. So, these are, this is a description of the, say, the problem, problem area and the reasons for, for, for this. So how can we use it to find out what to do? Very simple. We turn the problem tree into a solution tree, just like that. Oh, what happened here? All girls go to school. Yeah, that, that's what we want, isn't it? I mean, we had our central problem was not enough girls go to school. Now we want to have all girls go to school. That, that's what we want, okay? So how can we do that? We just shifted this, and we just shifted all the others here. Now it says here, girls' education is prioritized. Before it was girls' education not prioritized. Okay, that means if we prioritize it from the, from the family, then that's a good, I mean, it's a good contribution to girls go to school. And if also the school was close by, and that could be because the government is now prioritizing the schools, they're building more schools. So that is also supporting them. If we have good sanitation, if we have good water supply, <coughs> Then people would be healthy. Before they were sick, now they're healthy. So now they can go to school. And they also have a time available because they don't have to carry water and so on. So, so just by shifting tick, 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 all the, the negative statements to positive statements, then we suddenly get a logic. Now the schools go to school. Now they have good knowledge. Now they have an opportunity to earn money. And suddenly you can see what was logically before is logically still, again. So this is just what we have to do. Work on all these different uh, things here. This was a simple example um, for the pedagogical uh, purpose here. This is an example that we made in Ubu some years ago when we made an application. And uh, we put down together more in detail what is the problem tree here. You can see it gets more complicated in real life. Not enough water for all in the uh, called maybe Wasu area. This is a place in, uh, in Africa near to the Kamba. So that was the problem. There's not enough water. And that was because the water point is far away. We have water loss in the, in the, in the big pipe. We have an overuse of water by the upstream users. There's a big pipe leading uh, water to a lot of people, but most of it is taken in the top. Uh, why, why is it overused? Because it's used for <coughs> irrigation. There's a lot of waste from taps. People are just leaving it open here because people are not aware of the water scarcity. Why is the loss in the pipe here? It's because the distribution system is not, uh, it's, it's old, it's leaking, it's not extended. Uh, as much as it should, it's all this leaking because no one feels ownership, uh, because the organization is not functioning, so on, so on. So there's a lot of sub uh, reasons here. Again, we took it, uh, and, and, and yeah, I should say there's only water supply here. I mean, all, this is all only water issues about the water supply system. They also have other problems like poor hygiene practice and no sanitation fluoride in the water here. But we chose to focus only on the water. And if we look at the reasons for that, that, there's a lot of reasons for the water supply system, that people are not having enough uh, water. Uh, and this leads to other things. But the main thing is, this is what we try to solve. We're not solve everything in the world, but we try to focus on this. 
So when we turn it around, now there's enough water because we have no loss because the water point has come closer. We have more water points. Uh, good legal connections instead of illegal connection. The water main pipe is repaired. We have funds because they start to pay for water and so on and so forth. So that, that is the, the uh, positive, the solution tree. We cannot, we cannot work with all of this. Some of it is, is, is not even uh, possible for us. We have no influence on it. But we could choose to work on several things. And what we planned to do was these yellow things here. This is a bit uh, special to put it on top of the, uh, the solution tree here. But there's just to say more specifically how we, how we support. For example, we wanted to give some legal support for the organization that was not having the rights. We had an organization that was managing the system, but they didn't have the legal rights. So we wanted to support them legally here. Uh, they didn't know the system very well. So we helped them to do some mapping of the water supply system. Uh, we, we, we bought some start equipment. We did some training of them. We helped them to set up a transparent payment system, put up some water meters, and help people to, with advocacy to, to talk to the water supply organization, um, made it set up, helped set up some loans, at least this was what we planned to do. We did, we, as I said, we focused on the water supply, but we're also aware that sanitation and better hygiene is also important. So we did some promotion, some promotion of latrines, but not something that we put very much emphasis on here. So, um, so by working here and there, we can make a lot of uh, improvements in the, in the system here. Um, yeah, so that, that's how to do a problem tree. We would like you to do a problem tree after we come to over there. And uh, you should have to select, discuss in your group, what is actually the main problem you want to solve and how is that connected, what problems is leading to that and how can you, so what have problem has to be solved. It's understandable, yeah? Pretty simple. So we only make one problem. You only make one problem in a problem tree. It's very important you only have one problem to but solve. You can, if you have more problems, you make more trees. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 that would be it, yeah. It's not always so simple. Usually, I think most projects is like that. You can, you can point at one problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. Also, because the, then you can focus your interventions when you know what you have to solve. Instead of we work a little this, we work with this, oh no, then you don't know where you're going. Good. That central problem leads to something you need for the project planning. And here is another tool that is used by all organizations. Uh, all projects, international development projects, but also any lot of other projects are, are using logical framework approach, LFA. And um, the purpose of it is to bring clarity, coherence into the project. Uh, you want to have a tool that is really showing you what is this project in a short uh, overview form you know what the problem, uh, what the project is about here. You use it for designing the project, you use it for planning and management. Um, lot for design, lot for planning, less for management, but, but in reality you can also go back to your logical framework approach always and see are you on the right track. If you need to take decisions on, on this, you can go back and see is it following our project. Uh, not always done like that. It's a reference for monitoring and evaluation. When you have this overview of your project, when you send someone, when you each year has to write your report about how is it going, you go back to your logical framework matrix and you see how we following, where are we in the process to, to reach uh, our goals and so on. 
all the donors are using LFA uh, in some version. There's a little bit uh, different. Uh, it's a language with some different dialects. Uh, someone, uh, old colleagues said. Uh, there's different ways to do it, but not very, very different yet. And the thing is that it can all, can be developed in a participatory manner. The, the project, if you sit with your people, if the, the people you're working with and develop this logical framework <coughs> matrix that I'll get back to, then it, it is a participatory process. It's very good if you sit and agree on, this is our problem, this is what we want to work with, this is how we're doing it. So, these are the main headings in a, in a logical framework approach. The, when you do it yourself or with the stakeholders, uh, you will find out what is a development objective here. Development objective is not obtained within the period of the project, but it's something that is overall uh, for, for your project. It, it could be that there are some objectives, here says national sectoral objectives, which the pr project will contribute to. Let's say you, you want the whole everybody to have access to water. That could be your overall objective, but you're working with something a little bit more limited because you don't have the whole country. You're only working in one village. Yeah. But you have something called the immediate objective, and that is what the objective that you're going to obtain in this project. That is the new situation that you want to have after you've finished your project. In the, so, so the day the project stops, this objective is obtained here. Then you have some, th this is a kind of the new situation. Everybody is drinking clean water. And that's what you want here. You also, also have some outputs. Um, this is more tangible. I mean, this is the outputs are leading to the objectives. For example, you have a number of water points uh, set up. You have some sanitation established. Then you could expect that people are uh, using it or more healthy or whatever to do here. So there's some outputs. Then there's some activities. What are you going to do? Combined with the time plan, but activities. And then inputs, that is all what you need in order to get the project done. And it's put into a, a log frame uh, matrix here, which uh, you can see the same headings here, development objective, media objective, outputs, activities, inputs. So here's the description of it. And I'm taking a, an example. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's right. That, this is the connection here. Uh, the central problem in the problem tree. This is where you come from the problem tree to the to the uh, to the log frame matrix here. The central problem is here. Then you could have some underlying uh, courses here, uh, things that you want to solve, and that should be maximum three uh, immediate objectives. Uh, formula. It, it, this is a bit. This general for logic log frame matrices in some dialects, you could say, but um, also for your for your exercise here, in the, your application here. These are some tangible outputs, as I said, things you can measure. Yeah, and all of this is formulated as a new situation you want uh, to obtain. I'll give you an example here, and it's a uh, very different from the one that you are going to work with, but it's something you know very well because this is a log frame for the, this course, environmental engineering in developing countries. So if I should say I, it's a three weeks course and if I should put some uh, development objective uh, to this, I could say this is something that is not obtained, as I said, it's not necessarily obtain this development objective. Let, let, let's start with the immediate instead, because this is more tangible. By the end of January 2015, 35 students have completed the course and learned to do WASH project design. That is actually my objective with this course, that 35 people have uh, 
passed the course and you have learned to do project design. Let's say that very clearly, shortly. Um, and you can see I put numbers quite specifically. I put a date and, uh, and, and try to be as specific as possible. Also very short because that's the point of this, have short and precise information. Uh, but I also formulate a development objective that the number of uh, students here is involved in NGO project fieldwork is increased by 50%. Uh, it's not necessary, but it could be I had an underlying uh, idea that I wanted you, uh, some of you, to be involved in some NGO work. And I wanted to increase that number from what it was before. So I put this as the development objective. What is specific outputs? This is what you can measure. Okay, I can see that Friday last week, seven uh, technical reports, oh, it was eight, sorry, we have eight groups now. Eight technical reports were handed in, and on Friday, we have also seven, eight applications uh, handed in here. And on the 28th, that is the week after, in one and a half week, next Wednesday, 35 students have received the grades. That's what we can measure. That, that, that is, uh, I mean, it can be more difficult to, to measure if you learn how to do project design here. It's, it's more complicated. But at least the way we, what we can see when the, finish, when the course finished is that we have some reports. So what are the activities we have to do there? We have to prepare some lectures, update the schedule, that is what I'm doing. Uh, give the lectures on time, uh, schedule. I have to supervise group work during three weeks. Tobian and I have to do that. We facilitate your oral presentation the uh, Wednesdays, two, two times. We have to read your reports, give you some grades, and we have to inform DTU about the grades. So these are the activities we have to do. And in order to do this, we need some inputs. For example, some hours, some money, DTU has to pay me some money to be here and teach you. We need some rooms for the lectures. We need some textbooks from Bangladesh. Or okay, so if we look at the uh, yeah, so, so, so here we have very shortly described what are the inputs activities. I'll, I'll come back to the logic a little bit later. There's one thing more here that I would also like you to do. It's very important to to look at the indicators and the means of verification. And that is how we can measure this. So it can be, as I said, a bit difficult to measure what you have, whether you have learned this here. So if we look at some indi indicators, um, it, it's about how, how we can uh, measure things. For example, it's not relevant to measure activities. Whether I was here, I mean, I was here, I did the lectures and so on. It's not so relevant to, 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 to find uh, indicators. But for the outputs, for example, how do we know that these are handed in? Okay, we have to check the, the reports that they are uploaded. We can see it on CampusNet. Maybe I should write CampusNet here. Check CampusNet and grading delivered on time. We, we can see in the files, it would be the files. Uh, it's not really well formulated. But this would be files of CampusNet files of DTU that this has been handed in here. The objectives uh, indicators is that uh, if I, I mean, one thing is that you have passed, you have completed the course and learned how to do WASH project. It's difficult, but I, I would say if 90% of the 35 students here uh, has passed the course with a grade of four, then I could say that uh, that it is obtained here. Yeah at least yeah, for 90%. So I would say that is a indicator that you have more than four. Then you say, good, then you know how to do it. If we look at the development objectives, we can look at the how many are doing field works. Last year it was seven uh, DTU students doing field works on, on uh, UBUS projects. Next year we wanted to increase by 50, so if there's 11 next year, then we have obtained that. And then finally, we also put some assumptions here. These are situations, invariant conditions, decisions which are necessary for the success, but is largely beyond the control of the project management. So we 
we can do some things, but we cannot. We have to also assume sometimes some things. We cannot control everything here. For example, uh, it will be difficult to. I mean, I can give the lectures and so on, but if you think it's just so boring and so terrible to be here, you would probably leave the course. I mean, so so it's not enough. If, if I teach terribly here, if I do the activities terribly, we will not reach the outputs. You will not deliver your repast because you would run away. So we hope that the teaching will not scare you away. Um, how can you? How you should learn to do wash uh, project design here. And the thing I can see is that you're handling your reports. That's how I can check that you know things. I read the report and I see it. But it could be you have uh, copy pasted the whole thing from uh, somewhere. Last year's reports are from the internet. So I assume that you're not doing copy pasting here. Uh, because otherwise we would not, you would not learn anything if you copy pasted everything here. And how, how do you make sure that you're, uh, you're contributing, uh, you are, what is it, participating in uh, project uh, field work here? That is the assumption that many of you will join on Wednesday, the, where we tell about possibilities for doing uh, field work here. So we're hoping, these are some assumptions that you would come, uh, some of you. And here comes the logical. This is where framework becomes logical. If we're doing these activities, if I'm teaching, <coughs> facilitating, all that, and you're not scared away, then you will actually deliver your reports. If you deliver your reports, and you're not cheating, you're not copying the things in your report, then you learn. Then you learn uh, how to do watch project. And if you learn how to do watch projects, and you participate and take interest in hearing about how to do field work, then you're probably going to be involved in doing field work. I mean, that, that's, I, I, I cannot control this. I mean, I, I can do my best, but I cannot really control these things. So these are assumptions, they are, they are important. And that's the logic, this is the way when you, when you fill this, this uh, table here this afternoon. Try to make sure that that there is this this logic here. When you don't know what to put in the fields, take a look at this. About the assumptions, they are important here. Uh, when should you ask? Uh, when should you add an assumption here? You should ask yourself: Is the assumption important for the success of the project? Then you should ask it. Then you should do it. Otherwise, delete it. Don't put all kinds of silly assumptions. Uh, I mean, try to evaluate. Is it important for the success of the project? Will it hold true? Do you think it re is it realistic here? No. Um, I mean, if you know that it will uh, hold true, then you delete the assumption. There's no need to put an assumption that you're not, if you're sure it will hold true. If it is, um, or perhaps, then it's a good assumption. Maybe it will hold true. You think it will hold true. And if it's no, then you look at the third question here. Can the problem with the assumption be taken into account in the project design? Can you uh, somehow uh, change the project? If you find out the assumption will not hold true, I mean, in general, you should stop the project. Because if it's a no, if you cannot change the project so, so, um, so you can make this assumption true, which is important, then it's called a killer assumption. If you know that this is not going to happen, if you know people are not going to pay for that sanitation that you're offering them, then you should give up the project. It's not going to work out. And if you can change it, then you then you reformulate it. But some assumptions, and this is where we usually end, is yeah, we think we think so. We'll do our best. We will create awareness. We will give campaigns. So we assume that people are actually taking interest in this, and they are 
giving money, so they will do it. This is a valid assumption, um, and then we keep it. <coughs>